Most of you might not know this, but there has been a concerted effort by many scholars and Trinitarian apologists to change, or as they call it, modify, expand the Jewish Christian creed known as the Shema, cited by Moses in Deuteronomy 6.4, and of course, the Messiah Jesus in Mark 12.29. In so doing, they have pitted the Jewish Shema versus what they call a Christianized form of the Shema, where now the one God of Israel, known as Yahweh and Father, is more than one person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I first found this in James Dunn's Christology in the Making from 1980. In 1 Corinthians 8, Paul starts from the common ground of the basic monotheistic faith and asserts that Christ the Lord also is one, thereby he splits the Shema, the Jewish confession of monotheism between God the Father and Christ the Lord in a way that has no earlier parallel. Then we have the noted N.T. Wright, writing in the 1990s. The Shema is actually expanded so as to contain Jesus within it. Paul has modified Jewish monotheism so as to place Jesus Christ within the description, almost the definition of the one God, a radical redefinition of monotheism. Paul, in other words, has glossed the word God with the Father and Lord with Jesus Christ. And then we have Bauckham. The only possible way to understand Paul as maintaining monotheism is to understand him to be including Jesus in the unique identity of the one God affirmed in the Shema. He's identifying Jesus as the Lord, whom the Shema affirms to be one. The unique identity of the one God consists of the one God, the Father, and the one Lord, his Messiah. This confusion among many Trinitarians is shown by other evangelical scholars who rightly state that the divine name Yahweh used in the Shema in the Hebrew Bible, and it's rendered by Theos, God, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. But by far, says Harris, the most common Greek rendering of Yahweh is Okidios. Being a proper noun and the covenant name of Israel's God, Yahweh is invariably the name of a person who sustains relationships with other persons. This name is never used generically of deity, but always personally and individually of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I would add, obviously, he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is highly confusing because we just went through just a few samples of other noted evangelical scholars that are arguing that the Yahweh, the one God of Israel of the Shema, has a split personality. And according to them, is now to be understood as both the Father and the Son. The simple fact is that the laws of biblical grammar prohibit this kind of interpretation because the Greek of the Shema means simply that he is one, that is one person, Yahweh. So you have Deuteronomy 6, the Lord is one, and you'll see that the Greek, Kyrios is estin, that is, the Lord, he is one. And then you have Jesus in Mark 12, the Lord our God is one Lord. Kyrios oteos emon, Kyrios is estin. So here's the response by the Jewish rabbi that agrees with Jesus. Yes, God, he is one. You are right, Jesus. And as you see, the same Greek phrase, Galatians 3.20, God is one. Theos is estin. James 2.19, is estin o theos. And once again, the Trinitarian confusion is shown by the fact that many evangelical dictionaries, commentaries, lexicons will tell you this simple fact of the biblical language. The masculine is is one person. The noted F.F. F. Brown in his commentary on the Gospel of John, from earliest times it has been observed that Jesus says, I and the Father are N, not is, that is one in action, not in person. So this is in reference to John chapter 10, verse 30. And as you can see there, the Greek word is different. You have Thayer's Greek English lexicon, where the word is takes the place of a predicate it means one person. Robertson's word pictures, is, means one person. And others, 
The word one is masculine in gender and therefore is personal, referring to a person. The noted Bruce Metzger, the masculine is must be distinguished from the neuter n. Is means one numerically, while n means one in essence. And then he cites John 10.30. Had it said is in John 10.30, it would have meant one person. In other words, if Jesus has said, I and the Father are one, using the Greek is instead of n, then I think most of Christianity would be oneness. You have others here. One, when masculine, sets forth the idea of cardinal numeral one. When referring to people, always the cardinal numeral is implied. The anchor Bible. One is neuter, one thing and not one person. And then they show the same example there of N, not E's, in those verses. It's often noted that John 10.30 uses the neuter N, that is one thing, rather than the masculine E's, one person. The latter reading would lead to the unorthodox position that Jesus and his Father are one person. The word one in Greek E's appears 90 plus times in the New Testament. When used for people, it never means more than one person. You'll find this throughout the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the letters of Paul, Galatians, as we saw, 1 Timothy, in James and Romans, 1 Corinthians, as well as Ephesians. The nominative masculine form, is, simply means one person. For more than one person, as we saw in John 10.30, another Greek word is used, and is never modifies personal words like Deus or Kyrios. When used of God, the one God of Israel, Yahweh the Father, the word God and Lord take on almost a personal name. Phrases like the Lord is one, God is one, or one God are almost code for Yahweh, that is the God and Father of our Lord and Messiah. And many scholars note this. In addition to the Shema, and perhaps in some cases as a substitute for it, one finds that at the beginning of the Christian era, the formula is o teos was used to express the monotheistic faith of Judaism. It would be unthinkable to now say that it expresses the Trinitarian so-called monotheism of Orthodox Catholic Protestant tradition. Now, an interesting postscript to all of this comes with James McGrath's The Only True God, published in 2009, where he says, the main difficulty with the view that Paul has split the Shema to produce a Christological monotheism, whatever that might mean, is that it does not do justice to the nature of the Shema itself. It would be very difficult for Paul to distinguish between the word God in the Shema as referring to the Father and the word Lord in the Shema is referring to the Son, since the Shema clearly identifies Lord, rendering the tetragrammaton, that is the divine name, the four letters called Yahweh or Jehovah, and the word God. That Paul could do this in passing without explaining it or defending it seems very unlikely indeed. The next year, in 2010, the affirmation James Dunn who was one of the first to propose this splitting of the Shema, as we saw in his Christology in the Making, well, 30 years later in 2010 published, Did the First Christians Worship Jesus? And he writes, However, the point is not quite as clear-cut as Bauckham suggests, for the question arises as to whether Paul did indeed intend to split the Shema. It's quite possible to argue alternatively that Paul took up the Shema and to that added the further confession and one Lord Jesus Christ, so that the fuller confession of 1 Corinthians 8.6 could be said to be a more natural outworking of the primary conviction of Psalm 110, verse 1, where you have Yahweh, Jehovah, addressing someone who is not God. So this is quite an interesting concession made here by James Dunn, probably influenced by James McGrath, who was, by the way, his student. So that now we're on the right track. Paul obviously is not splitting the Shema, a blasphemous proposition for a Jew. No, simply put, the declaration by Paul is wholly within the Jewish creed of his ancestors, and to that 
he might be alluding to, as Dunn says here, to Psalm 110.1, one of the most cited Old Testament verses by the New Testament writers, because they full well know that really the whole story of the Bible is about two lords, the Lord, Jehovah God, and his only begotten human son, who has been made Lord, Messiah, according to Acts chapter 2.